Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, we're talking about chapter 14. And in chapter 14, we're going to talk about or introduce the promotional P. Uh, we've talked about pricing. We've talked about uh, distribution, the place P. And we also talked about the actual product P with, as well as packaging. Now, generally, when we, we think about marketing, we've, we've talked a lot about the marketing mix, the traditional four Ps. And we're now going to talk about just promotion P and, and talk about what we call the promotional mix, or so all the elements that in, are involved in actually promoting products and services. And we'll talk about what integrated marketing communications is. And then we'll talk about the communication process from the time that a sender of a message sends it out to the time that receivers receive the message in whatever form it might be. And we'll talk about the whole process, the steps that go through to try to either inform, make people aware, persuade people um, based on messages sent out from marketers to their potential customers. And then we'll, we'll talk about um, steps in developing effective communication. Um, not all communication is effective. And we, we see that when, when some brands build brands quicker, faster, they're more sustained, people perceive better quality in certain brands over others. That just means that some are more effective than uh, some of their competitors. And then we'll talk a little bit about budgeting in terms of how, what kinds of elements you need to look at when it comes to deciding what kind of money to spend, how to allocate it across the different ways that we could communicate with potential consumers. And then finally, we'll talk about some uh, aspects related to uh, socially responsibly um, communicating and what, what that might involve. So again, the promotional mix, it's, it's the blend of advertising, public relations, personal selling, direct marketing, uh, you can throw in sponsorship. All these are, are different ways that we can communicate and promote our product, brand, or service. Let me just take it one at a time. Advertising generally, if, if we had to characterize advertising compared to promotions, the main key issue that distinguishes it is that advertising generally is longer term in terms of its impact or effect. So it takes many, many times for someone to see a message before they actually act or behave in the way that the message is intended. And that's building awareness and being able to recall and remember the, the particular brand and all the benefits, uh, getting up off the couch and run to the store and pick that brand out off the shelf. It's gonna take more than just one ad that someone sees either on a broadcast network, print, internet, or a billboard that they see outdoors. Now, a couple of points I want to make here just generally about the trend that we're seeing as far as where advertisers are actually sending or spending their money. Um, broadcasting is a lot more fragmented these days, so you can pretty much find a specific channel on the cable system or satellite dish uh, and a specific programming that can target whatever segment you're trying to hit in a very, very targeted way. So if you think about Spike TV, if we're talking about young males, uh, or if we're talking about the Wii channel, if we're talking about females, and then you overlay that with specific programming on those channels, we'll get you a very, very targeted um, response. Uh, print, somewhat dying. Uh, I think it's not something that's um, shocking to most of us. Um, but they're, they're trying to figure out how to integrate the traditional print medium, magazines, newspapers, and trying to figure out what they can do online. Newsweek, as an example, a long, long-standing quality pro, uh, uh, print magazine that's been out for decades, decided that they wanted to go to an all-online exclusive. And then you have some outlets that began using uh, the online platform. So Huffington Post, uh, is now one of the leading sources for news information and obviously a really good advertising platform. Uh, and that started out exclusively online and it never had a physical print issue. Um, internet, again, that kind of overlays all that, that what we're talking about. Outdoors, there's still some room for that at special events, uh, traditional outdoor media that we see, billboards, uh, ads that are in public transportation systems, on buses, in trains, 
Uh, all those are, are some examples of what goes on outdoors, and it still has its place. The important point that any marketer has to, to, to address is what medium do we have that connects with our target market in the most direct way and the most cost-effective way. Sales promotions, generally there, there are two types of sales promotions. There are consumer-based promotions, and then there are trade promotions. Consumer-based promotions are typically going to be your coupons and the, the free samples that we receive in the mail, um, you know, um, rebates that we might get for purchases that we make. Uh, we fill in the form online or send it through the old-fashioned snail mail, and we get a rebate for our, our purchasing. Um, trade promotions, on the other hand, are going to be those promotions that are done from manufacturer through the retailer, which eventually gets the consumer. And usually they come in the form of incentives given directly to the uh, actual retail outlet. So if you manufacture Pampers uh, diapers, Procter & Gamble, uh, you may tell the retail channel, I'll give you 10% more based on what you purchase. So you purchase 10 cases, I'll give you a case free. And the, the goal really is to get that benefit. And the benefit is the unit cost for each case of Pampers has gone down because Procter & Gamble gives them one case free for every 10 that they buy. Hopefully that additional benefit financially trickles down to consumers. That's a trade type of promotion. And that's more of a push strategy. And we'll talk about that uh, a little later on. The pull strategy would be more the traditional consumer-based couponing, uh, rebates, where we're giving incentives as manufacturers directly to consumers and hopefully stimulating demand and having them come into the retail outlet demanding the product. And if there's not enough of the product on the shelves or in the warehouse or in the storage room, uh, what happens is the retailer then goes back to the manufacturer and essentially pulls the product through the channel. And that's going to be more of a pull strategy. Public relations, on the other hand, uh, typically is more of what I would call a reactive type of uh, portion of communications. They tend to react. Um, the people who work in, in uh, public relations typically are your communications majors, whereas people who do promotions and marketing, of uh, uh, consumer promotions, couponing, and that kind of stuff, they're typically going to be your marketing majors. But generally, um, they, they do all sorts of things, but they're professional communicators. Uh, they don't tend to do a whole lot of persuasive types of communication. For them, it's putting out information to clarify, um, basically making sure people know the side of the story of the manufacturer. So sometimes you might find there's a bunch of stuff going on in social media that's negative, rumors essentially and so they're there to kind of put the fire out or they might be there when there's some you know travesty some catastrophe and it might be some product liability related issues uh, firestone went through some stuff several years back where uh, their tires were, were actually being blown i think it was on a ford uh, suv uh, causing several deaths and so for them they had to really step it up to not only uh, make sure that all the manufacturing things were done to make the product safe, but they had to communicate directly to the consumer to make sure that they understood that they were really on it to, to get things um, fixed appropriately. Um, so again, I mean, public relations generally, if I had to characterize it, I'd say public relations is more of a reaction type of a tool, whereas marketing generally is going to be a little bit more proactive. Personal selling is always going to be important um, whenever we have a product that's a little bit more complicated, uh, that's um, more detailed, uh, where people need, a more, need more information and they need someone's ability to communicate as to how to use the product or how the product integrates or fits into some other product that they may have purchased or how it specifically satisfies a need or provides a benefit. And so you do it through presentations, through trade shows. Um, these folks generally are the ones who you will see who will have face-to-face -face contact with consumers. Think about the last time you purchased a car. Obviously, personal selling is an integral part of that. Um, very sophisticated types of uh, products 
in the technology domain, you need people to, who understand the product who are able to communicate. Very important, but the more sophisticated and the more complicated the product is, the more likely you'd have to engage personal selling as part of your communication strategy. Direct marketing, uh, we've seen changes in direct marketing through the popularity of the internet, uh, whereas before internet uh, marketing um, was in existence, typically when we think about direct marketing, we thought of the old fashioned catalogs, the ones that were mass mailed out to millions of people. Uh, Finger Hut is a, a brand name that's been around for decades. Uh, one of the original direct marketers was Sears and Roebuck at the time. Now we call it Sears. Um, but the Sears catalog was something that, that millions of people had in their household. And you take the catalog, you flip through it, you figure out what you wanted to order, and you would call it the 800 number. Now the internet has kind of made that particular side of direct marketing die somewhat. We still get catalogs, but nowhere near what we used to get a couple, three decades ago. Uh, telemarketing, same thing. Um, now what's taken the place of telemarketing is interacting with people online and they could use the chat function in a very effective way to get an interaction going back and forth between salespeople or customer service people and um, the potential consumer. Kiosks have always been important too where you have an, an opportunity to engage people in a limited cost effective way so rather than opening up a, a physical store in a mall it might make sense on a limited basis to have a kiosk where you can expose people to your brand, have them feel and touch your brand, and then place an order there, or in, in this day and age, actually go online and, and place the order um, there. So what, what we see is through, through the internet and through technology generally, in terms of mobile technology specifically, uh, we're seeing that c consumers are more informed about their options and pricing and benefits. Uh, there's obviously more communication going on, much of it coming from the manufacturer, seller, and directed to consumers, but also to information that's coming from other consumers. So you, you have this peer-to-peer uh, -peer type of communication going on, as well as information coming directly from the people who make stuff or people who are actually trying to sell stuff at the retail level to consumers. And so it's the technology. There's, there's a whole lot less of mass marketing. The opportunity to customize the message by way of who says it, where you say it, um, is very important these days because when we think about mass marketing, that means essentially one message for everyone. And with the tools that we have at our disposal today in terms of communication, it just really makes no sense to not try to customize it to the extent that the technology will allow us to do. So that brings us to this concept of integrated marketing communication. Essentially what it is, is making sure you have a clear message that's delivered through all the channels that you're using to communicate to consumers. Again, consistency and clarity means that your message is going to be received in a way that will achieve the goals that you're trying to achieve. So if the goal is to, to create awareness for a brand with attributes A, B, and C, if some of your communication only talks about attribute A and not B and C, and then maybe vice versa, um, it just makes it very confusing. Or if there's misinformation out there in terms of what your product can be used for, it just makes it more confusing to consumers. So it's about clarity, it's about consistency, and it has to be a message that's compelling that hopefully will enhance the reputation of your brand and hopefully at a bare minimum inform them about what you, your brand can do, but maybe also to persuade them to actually go out and purchase the product. So the general discussion that, that we always have when it comes to integrated marketing communication is looking at all the different tools that we, we just talked about. And again, it's about having a consistent and clear message. The more consistent and the more clear your message can be, we say basically that your communication is very well integrated. High IMC essentially means you have a stronger brand message at the end. Now, when, when organizations develop these messages, they kind of all go through pretty much the same. And I will take this through this process. The sender and the sender here could be Nike. And encoding essentially is how you take that message 
and you put it into a format that you believe your receiver will be able to understand it. Understanding essentially means decoding it. And so in, in the, the example that we can give here with Nike, encoding in that particular case could be having the right spokesperson, having Le LeBron James be the face of Nike, or developing a character to deliver the words and the benefits or connecting with consumers. We see this a lot in, in products like insurance where they create characters, um, like the Geico Gecko or the Cavemen that they use or some of the other characters that they've used in their commercials that you've seen. And where it's a way of encoding the message so it can break through the clutter. If we're talking about an endorsement, hopefully it's gonna be someone who is believable, who's likable, somebody who the receiver will look at and say, well, yeah, LeBron James should know a lot about athletic footwear. Uh, I believe the message that he's sending. So you, you create the message and the message again should be whatever achieves your goals. And if it's to create awareness, it's really about talking to people about what the benefits are of your product. If it's persuasion, you talk about the benefits of the product and how specifically it solves a problem. And in some cases, you can use comparative advertising where you're comparing your brand to another leading brand. And so you talk about it from the standpoint of here is our brand, especially if we're you know lagging in the market in terms of market share, you know, the whole Avis and, and Hertz um, types of advertising that they've done for years. If you happen to be the secondary brand, it's okay to bring up the, the front runner. If you're a front runner, if you're, if you're Hertz, you don't mention Avis. But generally the message should be clear, it should be concise, and it should be on point and targeted based on who the segment that you're trying to target, the receiver. The coding is really where the receiver believes the message. They see consistency in how you encode it, who the spokesperson is as an example and whether or not they believe that person can speak to the benefits of that particular product. And then down below, the question then will be, once the receiver receives a message, how will they respond? And so the response should be, at a bare minimum, finding out more information. So maybe sending them to the website so they can find out more information about your product. But hopefully the ultimate goal is to, to get them to get off the couch and go and buy the product, either buying it online or just going to the retail store and actually making a purchase. So as you can see, this is a loop. And so the feedback will be uh, from the actual receiver. The feedback may be going to the website and actually downloading information about it or a GoDaddy's done this where they'd run a commercial on TV and then you'd find the ending to the commercial. And usually it's gonna be something dramatic or or funny, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and so what they do is they go to the website and the feedback for them is the engagement that they have online with the actual site itself. And then many times you can even ask them to fill out a survey, um, um, actually sign up for a mailing list where you can actually send them new and additional types of information. Um, so the feedback there is, is really going to give the sender an opportunity to say, was the message that we sent out to the receiver, was it effective? And the answer might be yes. And then you continue to send out the same message, but also the answer might be no. And sometimes the answer being no might be things that are going on in the marketplace. What your competitors are saying in their messaging, it may be the person who you are using to represent your product, maybe going through some issues in terms of that person's public uh, opinion or reputation and then so that might mean you might have to drop Tiger Woods as, as many of his sponsors did when he went through his issues about three years ago. <clears throat> so generally when we think about you know effective communication we, we need to kind of talk about you know some of the steps that, that we want to go through in an organized type of way. We obviously everything starts with segmentation targeting positioning so identifying the target audience we want to determine what our goal is and objective might be. Do we want to create awareness? Do we want to create just general buzz and have people spread the word about our, our product? Do we want to actually have them go out and physically buy the product or run online and actually purchase it? And then we design some kind of message. We need to choose a medium that we're going to use to, to communicate with them. And then we have to say, when we, we look at the message itself, how are we going to actually communicate to people um, what actually the message will be. And we'll just take these one at a time. 
So when we identify the top target market, we'll say what will what will be said. You know, how will it be said? Okay, basically, who are we talking to? When it will be said? Where it will be said? Who will it, will say it? Again, do we have a spokesperson? Do we use a radio spot or a TV spot? Do we use um, colloquialism? Do we, will we use words or phrases that are more uh, what I would call casual? Or is it formal? Is it going to be funny? And so all these questions have to be answered once we identify who the target market will actually be. And generally, the, the, when we think about you know, looking at a particular target market, and then we say, how can we make sure that we can develop a process where we look at the different stages of readiness to receive our message? And so what first thing we might want to do is to, to maybe create awareness for our product. And so we ask the question of ourselves, how do we create awareness? So maybe it might have to be something a little bit more functional, delivering a, a message that talks about the bundle of benefits and how it so solves a problem. How do we make sure that they have the knowledge that's necessary uh, based on the information that we're actually sending out? Sometimes it might be that they might have to not only be aware of it, maybe we have to send a sample of it in the, in the mail so they can actually taste it or smell it, depending on the product. And then at that point, then we have to say, how can we decide whether or not they like it? Some sampling all the time is very important to, to lead to that point of actually liking. <clears throat> in the car domain, excuse me, in the automobile domain, the advertising basically creates the awareness and you arm them with enough information to get them curious about interacting with the physical product. Driving traffic to the showroom to get them in the cars doing the test driving. Hopefully they like the product and then they eventually prefer it. And hopefully there's some kind of conviction where they're willing to purchase it either with cash or they will be able to take out a loan or they'll lease it. And hopefully they'll eventually go in and, and purchase the, the product itself. Now, the AIDA model is one that's been used for, you know, for several decades now that talks about the different stages that we're looking at when it comes to getting a message across. And we talk about it in the context of getting their attention, holding the interest of the consumer, and having some sort of arousal or desire to actually go out and get information or to actually buy it. Hopefully, uh, the, the action would be actually making the purchase the desire might get them to the showroom, uh, but the action might be to, to get them in the car at a bare minimum for the test drive, and then hopefully, ultimately, get them to the point where they will actually uh, make the purchase itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we just design a message, it really depends on the content of the message. It depends on uh, the medium that you're actually using, uh, what the appeal is going to be, and we'll talk about some different types of appeals in, the, in a few minutes. Uh, but, but generally, it depends on the target market. It depends on what medium they respond to. It depends on whether or not they respond to something more dramatic, something funny, something emotional. So at the end of the day, in designing a message, it goes back to, again, who the target market is and what things they will respond to and you essentially create a message and put it out in a form that is appropriate for or format that's appropriate for that particular target market. And we've seen many commercials over the years and some of the commercials are more for what we would call rational appeal. Uh, that's going to be more functional benefit types of things. So when they start talking about miles per gallon and safety measures and the physical headroom and legroom in a particular automobile. Those are very rational types of things, more measurable stuff. When we start talking about more emotional-based stuff, it's really where we're trying to, to kind of stir up some positive or negative emotion. You see this a lot, the emotional appeal, when it comes to selling things like perfume. You know, those things, or, or, or men's cologne, those things where it's really difficult to, to talk about rational kinds of appeals 
when it comes to a particular fragrance. You're not going to be able to tell it through a commercial. They do have the little scratch sniff things in magazines, and you may have seen those many times, especially in female magazines or styling magazines for men like GQ, where they give you samples of the um, cologne or the perfume, and you could actually smell it on the card that's actually inside the magazine. But by and large, these emotional appeals uh, are going to be to try to pull at the heartstrings. I think Google had a campaign where they um, had this Dear Sophie campaign for a while. It was for Google Chrome and across all their different brands, uh, YouTube and Gmail. And it chronicled a father who was um, essentially creating content and chronicling his daughter as his daughter was you know, being born and, and started to age where he would take pictures and upload it to YouTube. Uh, he would send emails to an account that she would eventually get. All these things to kind of talk to consumers who are watching the, the actual commercial and say, yes, Google is interested in helping you achieve your goals in life. You can use a variety of products to, to connect with your daughter uh, even before she's born and throughout her life. So again, very emotional kind of appeal. Uh, we also see uh, moral appeals to uh, companies who are interested in connecting to consumers, who are interested in environmental issues, may, may talk about their initiatives with their company in um, saving the environment, supporting a particular cause, maybe it's education, maybe it's homelessness. Again, it's trying to make a connection between an entity, a physical entity, a company, and consumers by making consumers aware that this company that's made up of a bunch of people are really concerned about the same issues that individual consumers are also impacted by. Personal communications, we see this a lot when it comes to those types of products or services where it makes sense to have someone answer questions back and forth. And you, again, it's going to be for products or services where uh, there is some ambiguity in terms of the benefits or ambiguity in terms of how those benefits are manifested or how to use a product. So getting people online through you know, chat or some sort of face-to-face, -face, people even using Google Hangouts now to, to actually do that, um, actually interacting with people through your Twitter feed, even though it's not necessarily one-on-one, -on -one, it's kind of one-on-many um, post to Facebook and having people interact. And so all these things are, are, are really good ways using today's contemporary technology to engage consumers. And personal communication is, is always going to be important because you get feedback. And so the, the, the best thing you can get from consumers is an opportunity to address their concerns, good or bad. And so they always say a complaining customer is your best friend. And that is that is generally very true because you'd hate for a customer to stop buying your product or stop coming to your restaurant or or any other kind of product or service and then not tell you why they stop coming. And you just don't know. But if they tell you something is wrong, the odds are other people feel the same way. And so it gives you an opportunity to correct it. And therefore, um, it's beneficial that that initial person um, made the complaint. Many companies these days, because of the internet and technology generally, they're always trying to find opinion leaders. And these are people who know a lot, who are passionate about a particular product or category, or they just may have a big, loud voice, especially online. And But you want to find out who these personalities are, uh, what their characteristics are, who are they influencing, who do they communicate with. And what they find is that sometimes these opinion leaders are the ones that you need to connect with because they have a propensity to reach out to a larger and maybe even growing group of people. And so influence opinion leaders and then give them an opportunity to connect with a broader base of consumers. And they could that, that you could argue that that's part of what buzz marketing is about, uh, but buzz marketing uh, mainly through social media, uh, all that's going on on Twitter and Facebook. If if a company is on Twitter and Facebook and all they do is have a presence and they're sitting out tweets every now and then, without truly having a conversation and engaging with consumers, 
looking out for bad things that people are saying and correcting it, but also, too, informing people. And it's not only about selling. It's about making people that know that you know what the benefits are that they need. So let's say, for example, you are, are selling a service that deals with education. And so all your tweets may not be to have them sign up for different courses. Maybe your tweets may be to give them information that they can use to further their education without actually spending another dime, to kind of show them and demonstrate to them that it's knowledge acquisition that they're looking for. And so some of that you give them for free and others, which may be an upsell, might be them signing up for one of your courses. And some of the non-personal um, communication, uh, the traditional stuff, then that's going to be more along the lines of, you know, your major media, including print, broadcast, display, online media. Again, without necessarily having a person connecting with them, although we have people who are doing the writing, uh, people who are actually writing the scripts and creating the visual art. Um, but it's, it's really a, about here more in a mask way to, to communicate with people. And again, the, the important point here is you want to create an environment um, you know, that, that really reinforces the good things that they know about buying the product. Reinforce why they really should continue to buy the product that you sell. What are the benefits? And then maybe in a very subtle way, tell them why you do it better than anybody else who is in your space. Uh, some of the other ways that, that, that are done are, are what I would call more, uh, they're, they're non-personal ways, but they're more so ways that we're, or they are communicating with people as well as entities. So for example, newspapers, television shows, you do press conferences and press releases and things of that nature in hopes that somebody will pick up that particular press release and write an article or review about your product, either online or in print media. Or they put your product as a segment on Good Morning America or some local show that might be in the region where you're, you're doing business. Uh, things like grand openings and exhibits and public tours. Again, a good way to get people to have more hands-on interaction with the product itself and not necessarily for the benefit of them interacting with people. Uh, but again, people are going to have to be there at the exhibits and public tours, but it's really getting them an opportunity to have hands-on involvement with your product. Uh, a couple of points here. I think I mentioned this when I talked about the process model. It's really about selecting the right people um, who are going to be um, the deliverers of your message. And when I say right, I mean appropriate. Uh, there's a company that has a, a, um, a data measurement called the Q-score. And what they do is they measure the likability and the awareness that people have of particular athletes and entertainers. So you want someone who the um, public is highly aware of and they have a favorable reputation of them. And so that's always going to be the case. Somebody who's liked and somebody who also has some kind of um, believability. Always think about feedback and how you can connect. With technology today, especially through social media, most companies get more feedback data than they really want to respond to. But the important point here is giving them a forum to give feedback but making sure you have a mechanism within your organization to respond, especially if it's criticism. You'd hate to give people a forum to complain, but never really expond, respond to them. And in, in most cases, they just believe you're ignoring them. Never a good thing. Now, when it comes to budgeting, you, you really have to figure out what the budget is and figure out how much money you have to spend before you decide how to divvy it up. Uh, most companies, when we think about it, it, it's going to be something along the lines of what they can afford. Um, if it's a product-driven company and they believe that the product and the benefits of the product should really supersede everything else, you might have a lower budget. Um, you may also have in a very competitive set where a great product, they realize that they have to have marketing to differentiate them. Um, so you really have to figure out what it is you, you, you can actually afford. Usually when it's on the affordability method, uh, they really don't look at sales and the benefits you get from doing promotion 
sometimes they believe it just happens to kind of you know follow suit because of the quality of the product and but many companies will do something along the lines of the percentage of sales again this is a, a connected way of saying based on our history or based on what other companies in our in our direct competitive space do on average, what percentage of sales do they allocate to uh, promotional dollars? It could be 3%, it could be 5%. In some industries, it could be upwards of 10% or more. So it really depends on the industry. Again, it's just another method, percentage of your sales. You could also look at it in terms of, you know, again, what your competitors do. Um, and so it's really kind of keeping up with the Joneses. This is definitely more of a reactive kind of approach. And you know sometimes you just don't want to do no harm. And so you basically do the bare minimum that your competitors do because you figure if you don't overspend or they don't overspend, you won't overspend as well. But you know, again, a very low risk type of uh, strategy. Um, definitely not going to allow you an opportunity to make up ground if you're not the market leader and you're, you're really kind of chasing the coattails of someone else. Oftentimes, though, too, I mean, the, the I think the best approach is probably to say, you know, what is the objective and what amount of money does it take to achieve the objective? OK, and so there it's really about saying this is the objective and this is what the objective is going to do for us. Increasing market share, increasing awareness, uh, whatever the, the goal might be, and then asking ourselves the question, what kind of budget will it take? for us to be able to achieve those goals. More risk taking there. Um, so if you're, if you're off, um, you may find that you may have overspent to achieve or to try to achieve a goal that's unachievable. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's the most companies who are looking to grow and, and make strides and catching up with the uh, competitors oftentimes have to say, what's the goal and what resources do we need to put to it? to make sure we achieve that goal. <laughs> so I guess the point to remember is that um, when we think about advertising, advertising is great. Uh, but the lesson to be learned in advertising and promotions as well, it's really about figuring out how do you connect with your target market in order for you to achieve whatever your measurable goals are. And so it, it might be having something, a message that's really targeted that you have to repeat over and over again using one specific medium to connect with one specific target market with one specific message. And that hopefully then will achieve your goal. So at the end of the day, it's about, again, trying to achieve whatever that objective might be. Now, personal selling is, is always important. It's a really effective tool. Again, the, the important point here is that it's about relationship building. If we're talking about, like most companies should be, building relationships, uh, we have to figure out what role does personal selling have there in a very sophisticated, very complicated type of marketplace where consumers are not sure of all the benefits and they need people to explain if it's technical in nature somebody to explain the benefits of it uh, personal selling is going to be probably more important than any of the other tools that you'll have and so the the sales promotions like i talked about before uh, i think the the real key issue there is figuring out whether or not you want to have a short-term response in terms of your objective goals sales for example remember advertising it takes longer for that to impact the bottom line versus the sales promotions typically that's the stuff that coupons and the like that's the stuff that can generate revenue in a relatively short period of time it could be within the same month that you use those promotional dollars can generate revenue advertising in this particular month you're not going to see the benefits of that until maybe six seven eight maybe a year down the road again and it takes more effort to do that Uh, and public relations, again, I think it, it, it's really about using it to, to kind of shape more of a positive image. Oftentimes, like I said before, it's more of a reactionary type of uh, tool uh, that marketers use. Uh, direct marketing depends on the product, depends on the segment that you're trying to target. Um, so don't ignore direct channels. Um, but when you do 
direct marketing, just be careful because you don't want to necessarily alienate a traditional channel to distribute the product. So for example, um, you know, companies like Dell have to be really careful. Their bread and butter is direct marketing, although they do sell some stuff at the retail channel. And so any of the promotions that they're going to be doing to connect in terms of direct channel, you want to make sure that you're at least providing enough uh, promotions to, to drive traffic to those retail stores who are also selling your physical product. And I'm going to wind this up very quickly here. I mentioned this really early and in, in early on, and I talked about the difference between a push strategy and a pull strategy. Again, the main issue here in a push strategy um, is that when we think about trying to communicate with consumers directly, I'm sorry, in a pull strategy, we're going to communicate with consumers directly. We're trying to essentially create demand by the coupons that we send out getting them to go back to the retailer and say, hey, we want this product to have this coupon. If they don't have enough supply to satisfy the demand that you created, that basically pulls the product back through the channel to the retailer so consumers can then bring the coupons in and buy it. Conversely, in the push strategy, the benefits go to the consumer but through the retailer. The example I gave is you, you, you buy 10 cartons of, of Pampers and you get one carton free here thereby bringing down the unit cost and hopefully that cost will be be spread out and, and pushed down to the consumer. Again, so that pushes the product through the channel to the consumer. Whereas here, providing communication directly to consumers, increasing demand, and then having the product be pulled back through the channel. Okay, and finally, when we think about some of the, the things that are going on now in, in terms of advertising, there have always been laws that try to protect consumers. We've seen bait and switch where, where people actually a advertise a particular product in uh, traditional advertising, and then people come to the retail store and they have one or two of those items. Um, or they basically say, we only have one item, but here's a substitute, and that substitute's a lot more expensive. Um, so the communication has to be honest with consumers as, as well as resellers. Um, you don't want to be deceptive in any way. You don't want to be labeled as a deceptive advertiser. And there are lots of laws and regulations that you have to adhere to uh, in, in terms of communication and fair practices in terms of the wording that you're using, either in truth and labeling that you have on the physical product itself, the truth and advertising laws that they have, um, just make sure that, you know, thinking about doing any kind of advertising, always get your legal people involved, especially if you're running a sweepstakes or some kind of promotion where there is some sort of a chance to win. Just making sure that you dot all the I's and cross all the T's to make sure legally you've done all you uh, had to do um, to protect the organization as you run promotions like sweepstakes and contests and things of that nature. Anyway, that, that does it for chapter 14. And so um, I will see you on the other side.